Thanks for joining us for Archive Dives with Ox and AI. Uh, this week, we're diving into part three of our series on transformers. We started with attention is all you need, then we switched to a mathematical framework uh, for transformer circuits. This is a paper by Anthropic, and it's pretty long. It's actually just an interactive web page that uh, takes a while to read. So we only got through about half of it the last time, and we're doing part two today. We're trying to get at least one of these a week, and I was just like reflecting on how many papers we'll have read if we do that for a full year. 50 plus is pretty crazy. So <laughs> thanks for sticking with us, and let's, let's keep doing it. Uh, let me pull up Notion here. Like I said, this is part two of this paper from Anthropic, if you want to find part one that's on our blog and YouTube. And last week, uh, we inspected, inspected the entire circuit of a transformer and kind of looked at what each part did and was. That looked like this diagram that I broke down. And you can kind of follow all of the, into the token embeddings all the way through to their predictions. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts here. And last week was just a great, like, big picture zoom in overview. This week, uh, we're going to be breaking it down into all of its parts and building up from the simplest example back up uh, to from zero, what they call zero layer transformers to a one layer attention, attention only transformer to a two layer attention only transformer. I hope to get through all of these sections, but again, it's a long paper. So we'll see where we're at, at like the 30 or 40 minute mark going through all of these. And last week we had a working example of a sentence to try to map the math to an actual sentence. We had something like Paris can fly to Paris, France to stay in a Hilton, Paris being Paris Hilton and having to disambiguate all these words like can and fly throughout the sentence. They actually later in the paper use the first paragraph of a Harry Potter book. So I decided we're going to switch our example to Potter can fly on a Nimbus 2000 to Hogwarts. Um, because it has some of the similar properties of Potter could be the character or like a career. Uh, <laughs> so I'll be switching up the examples to do that. And I thought it was also interesting just to put that into Llama to 7 billion. And I said, finish the following sentence, Potter can fly. It actually added Harry at the front and can fly on a broomstick, which is interesting because I think even the fact that like the words can and the word fly next to Potter helped Lava 2 disambiguate that it was Harry Potter because any other type of Potter probably isn't flying. So key takeaways from session one, just as a reminder, we have this small little circuit here that you can think of as all of the attention heads within the sentence. They talk about them, each attention head being understood as an independent operation. And they read data from the current state and write data to what they call the residual stream as they're going along. So I like to think of this as like Potter comes in the bottom as a word or token embedding. It goes through all of these different attention heads each attention head is looking at the rest of the sentence and updating the meaning of all of the vectors at once. But just to simplify it, like updating the meaning of Potter once in the first layer, again in the second layer, and then eventually making a prediction out of can um, in this case. And so uh, what attention only models do is they kind of had this 
diagram of a full transformer where you take in the tokens, embed them, do all of the attention, run that through a multi-layer perception, and then make the prediction. Anytime you see logits, that's just kind of like what the next word is that's coming out. And when they say attention only, they're stripping out this multi-layer perception part and are left with just this tokens embed attention on embed. Um, and then this little pathway through the right hand side is what they're calling the residual stream. Um, so you can see this right here, you're taking in the tokens, you're doing attention. They have one pathway in the circuit that's kind of reading from the rest of the sentence and one pathway in the circuit that's writing back to the residual stream. But there's also a direct path from the current token you're on to the residual stream as well as this. So you can kind of picture at a high level that the information's throwing, flowing up through here and flowing through the attention mechanisms. Um, so starting with stripping all of that down, they break it down into what they call zero layer transformers. Uh, so stripping away everything we did above um, to just a simple like embed the word and then try to unembed it and pred predict the next word. And this isn't a new concept. This is kind of what the early word embeddings work was doing just to simply learn the meaning of a word given the meanings of words around it. And they say that this learns bigram statistics of the data set that it was trained on. Uh, so for example, it's since it's just predicting the word after it, uh, it kind of internally, these weight matrices learn that Barack is commonly seen with Obama and that like Lincoln might be seen with Abe or Nebraska, or if we kind of use our example of fly, fly could be seen with fly on, like fly on broomstick or fly to, like I'm flying in a plane to wherever the fly is buzzing around my head. Uh, fly was, his fly was down. So there's like lots of different bigram statistics that you could learn from this zero layer transformer. Um, but that's what they like to start you out with is just like, if you stripped down everything, you would basically just be learning a bigram model. And obviously that's not enough to <laughs> make a coherent sentence if you were just picking the most probable next word, you would never get these other combinations of fly. So it would be like fly on, on top, maybe top, whatever a common word that is with top and it never refers back to fly. So that's why they add in the attention mechanism. So the attention mechanism, uh, they say can be understood as an ensemble of these bigram models and then what they call a skip trigram model that combines all the information from the words around it, but can also skip around the sentence and combine information from other words in the sentence. And what that kind of looks like is the attention um, can make a more informed prediction about the output given surrounding words. So I like to look at it kind of as you have a bunch of words that are coming in or tokens that are coming in, token embeddings. Potter, is that a profession or a character? Can, is that like canned food? Is it a verb? Is it like, do I have the ability to, or do I have the permission to? There's a lot of different ways can can be used in a sentence. And then fly, is that a noun, a verb, or a bug? The attention heads, kind of call out to all of the other words, merge the information from other words, and then out the other end of this layer, you get 
like, oh, we're talking about Potter, the person or the fictional character, can the auxiliary verb action ability and fly also a verb uh, that is action. And in this case, like fly on a broom. Um, so that's kind of high level what the attention layer is doing. And they like to even break the attention head uh, and transformers have these mechanisms called queries, keys, and values. They split it even further into a uh, key query or query key circuit and an output value circuit. So you can think of it from the bigger diagram. This is kind of like a smaller version of that, but you have the key query circuit that is really the part that has the attention mechanism. And that's deciding which words it should look at within the sentence to update its meaning. And then it passes that to the output values circuit that says, given all of the words that I should look at, how should I merge them with myself to make a more updated version of my meaning? And so as they go through the paper, they really talk about how these two circuits interact with one another. Um, and specifically, they say the query key circuit job, and I think it's helpful to like map this to some of the map as well, is each entry describes how much given a, a given query token wants to attend to a given key token. And then the output value circuits job um, is trying to describe how much a given token affects the prediction, the final prediction, if attended to. Um, and often you'll see like WE as the the embeddings or the, the weight matrix for the embeddings, WQK as the weight matrices for the queries and the keys. And then they're multiplying that by the other embedding on the other, whichever the key or the query is to get that final attention mechanism. Um, they have these diagrams as well to try to show you where each one of those things happen. Um, so I find it useful to map, like when they have WU, that's the token unembedding at the very top. When they talk about attention, it's kind of here in the circuit. When they talk about the token embedding, that's at the bottom of the circuit. And then when they talk about the attention mechanism, that's also kind of in the middle here and they map out what all the terms are there. Um, I think Jennifer had a great question last week about how the keys and queries actually interact with each other. And um, so again, you can think of this in the context of our sentence as uh, the weight matrix for Q is allowing each token to say, I need more context about myself, but I know about myself and I know what kinds of things would help me uh, disambiguate myself. And then the WK matrix says, I can help with some of that context. If you merge with me, I might make you more verb-like. So I know I'm anthropomorphizing a little bit, but that's kind of the interaction that they do. And then they learn how to do this from lots and lots of data of examples of similar words in similar situations. Um, if the token embeddings are similar, they can kind of learn these patterns. Um, and then the OV or alpha value matrix talks about once you know which ones you want to pair together, it combines them and writes that information to the output stream um, and affects the words that are be going to be coming out. And they have really cool examples of this later in the paper. So we talked about bigrams before. They interpret these two circuits, especially in the one layer transformer, as skip trigrams. So uh, 
you can think of those two circuits as you kind of have a source, a destination, and an out. So these are the tri in trigram. So in our example above, um, instead of just having the bigram statistics of Potter and Can and Can and Fly, you can say Potter plus Can together might make it more of a person type thing that can fly. And then you can think of like can fly on as another skip trigram that can be combined with the first one to disambiguate Potter. And larger transformers uh, can kind of aggregate this up and abstract it into higher level concepts like a full subject phrase, a full verb phrase, and a full object phrase, um, or even full sentences, how they interact with each other. But in the single layer one, they they study them and they really <laughs> notice that they kind of only interact with the words directly next to them or only interact with like sub tokens that are next to them. And they have some really cool examples of mathematically looking at these things. So they looked at a, a query key matrix and an output value matrix where they had 12 heads and a, and a dimension of 64. They also looked at one that had 32 heads and a dimension of 128. And these links kind of have the visualizations there. Um, but they broke this down for every single one of the heads. So they have like head zero, zero, if you were looking at the key, and I might have to blow this up so you guys can see it a little more. Um, the key might be left. The queries that prefer the key are all of these um, random characters or symbols. And then how that affects the output are, if you see this query with this key, then it's more likely to predict these values. I think this one was a hard one to see why or how all of that interacts, but a more salient one might be the word eating and the word and helps predict drinking or the word eating or playing, eating and listening, uh, eating and talking. So you can kind of see they ranked what the outputs would be given these two pairs of keys and queries that went together. Um, and they did this for every single head within the network. So if you remember here, we have multiple attention heads that could pull out different characteristics of each of the words. And they actually did that mathematically. So if we look at the first attention head, um, it works a lot with these like combinatorial things like come and visit or walk and cry, <laughs> walk and laugh, simple and easy. Um, so it's a lot of like ands and ors and thens or ors or nots. Um, but then I scroll down to a later head and you can do this all at these links right here. It's just a lot of data to look at. Um, but you can see this one is really preferring like capital letters um, and how capitalization affects what's going to be predicted next. So uh, these single layer transformers can start to pick up on these like very simple rudimentary patterns, especially with the words like right next to each other. And I think it's just important to note that each head is kind of doing a slightly different, very rudimentary, like if I see uh, capital G, that affects um, what's going to be coming out the other end if you had uh, biz at the start, for example. Um, this is another interest, like I think, oops, not that one. Uh, illustrative example is like George 
And then if you saw B or M or W, that might change what the output is depending on which George it was. Um, and if you saw it in like the context of code, you might predict a string.io function or something like that. Um, so again, uh, we've we've kind of been like hand waving word vectors this whole time. I think it's important to note that like these tokens are subwords and these single layer transformers um, really just operate on these very minute details of how these tokens can interact with each other. Um, they say that the single layer ones do a lot of copying and primitive in-context learning. Um, and in-context learning can be thought of as prompting. So they're saying like primitive prompting. And it does a lot of copying where like if the source token is perfect and the destination token, which is like the, the key one, the key in the query that we're looking at, if you look at those together, uh, if you look at the output stream, of those, it really just copies a lot of information from perfect right into the output stream because you don't want to lose information about perfect. And since all of these are in vector embedding space, uh, they're copying a lot of the properties of perfect. Um, but you can also see that like super or absolute or pure are other candidate ones that could be interesting in to be used in here. Um, and it's it's also important to note when you're in an embedding space, like large and small would be next to each other, um, even though they have very <laughs> different qualities when they're put next to each other. But in the context of like an entire vocabulary, they both describe the sizes of things. Um, so you need more complex circuits on top of this to even uh, make more complicated decisions about how that affects the output. Uh, some other interesting skip trigrams that they notice on the data set they trained on, which I think was like a uh, C4 kind of dump of all of the internet, is they found a lot of Python uh, skip trigrams. So like if you saw a new line and tab and tab, the next one and i might have gotten that backwards is uh it attends to the new line and the tab and then it might put like some python keywords next because that's just a common things that are seen next to each other um they also saw in python predicting arguments for functions so if you had open and a comma it would predict tokens that were like read binary write binary read or write to complete this whole piece of code. Um, so it's not just, you know, English or human language that this stuff is really good at. It, it can also help for a lot of these common patterns in coding. Uh, they showed some examples for HTML as well, where like, if you know you saw a T body, it's very likely that the skip trigram might be like, okay, find the other opening bracket and then finish it with a, PD. Um, and then they studied a lot of like common English phrases as well, like keep in mind, keep at bay, back and forth, past and present, uh, et cetera. They also mentioned that these single layer ones, um, some of the attention heads are just primary, primarily used to pass positional information through. Um, so they're copying information about themselves and the word that it's attending to, but also copying information about where they are in the sentence. Um, and it's interesting that each one of the heads, uh, when you break it down to this small amount uh, or this very singular layer, uh, you can kind of look at, oh, this one is just looking at capital letters or this one is just looking at position. But again, looking at those small uh, variations in the sentence or small skip trigrams, 
isn't enough to do what we see today with ChatGPT. So they add another layer on top of it. Um, the intuition is that this allows depth and composition of all of these smaller level skip trigrams, which creates expressiveness in the sentence. Um, and so these two layer ones allow you to take the primitives like copying and naively choosing where to look next, given your position and compose them together. Um, and I will skip some of the math of that. And I think it's pretty interesting to go to uh, a live diagram that they have of this stuff. So they take the entire first paragraph of Harry Potter and they have an interactive um, diagram of how all of these words work together. And I'll pause there while I pull that up if anybody has questions so far. Um, Scott, seconds. can you read some of those questions while I pull this up? Yep. Uh, first question from Marcus. Hi, might be a beginner question, but wondering why there are only skip trigram and bigram heads instead of like quadrigram or higher. Yeah, so this is uh, specifically in the one layer attention only transformer. So they're saying that before you stack on the higher layers, this very simple model can only do the skip trigram and bigram, but the higher level ones come in when you start layering other things on top. So that's kind of what they're getting to next. Good question. Okay, feel free to ask a follow up if you need another one there, Marcus. And then Paul asked, actually, Paul, I don't know, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, so it's it's not really a question. It's more of an observation as I was looking at the the thing you had there with the the Python. Um, it seems like you know when we think about these generative things for code gen, Python lends itself really nicely to it because it has type formatting structure and pretty tight vocab. Um, whereas something that's a little more loose and a little more fluent, uh, like Ruby, might be a little trickier to produce good code. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder if people have done studies like this on different languages, because <laughs> Ruby versus Python, or even like C++ one, yeah. C++ has way stricter rules than the other two. Um, I wonder like what effect screening data distribution and like just amount of it has there as well. I've noticed like switching back and forth between Rust and Python for various things, the, uh, the quality of the suggestions I feel like goes up quite a bit in Python just because it's it's easy to imagine all the millions of Jupyter notebooks that went into that. But also with that, some of the predictable mistakes that are found in those Jupyter notebooks as well. Yeah. Totally. It's a cool observation. Um, so you can see all of the stuff <laughs> we've gone through so far to get to this point. But here's a really cool um, diagram that they put together where it's live and interactive to see as you go through the sentence what uh, the attention heads are doing at this point. And so I remember finding a couple interesting examples. Uh, the first one being like um, four if you click on it, or maybe number if you click on it, and then look at this specific attention head. Uh, it's really looking at the ones directly before it. And uh, since the attention mechanism is a soft max, it's actually really hard to see what other tokens um, that it's interested in, because usually there's like one that it's really interested in, and then the distribution really tails off. And that's just like property of a softmax. But then if you click, so if you kind of click through these, a lot of them are really just looking at the token right before it, um, especially with this particular head right here, 0, 07. Um, and you can think of the 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 02, like, that's layer zero 
had zero, layer zero had one. These ones in blue are layer zero had three or layer zero had eight. And um, if you click on those, like it's, it might not even be coming through <laughs> in the video very much, but like drive is highlighting start actually the most. Um, and Dursley is highlighting this comma up here. They also use the light blue color, so it's not very easy to see. Um, but you can kind of click through each word and see what it's attending to the most. What's really cool about this is, so in the first layer, they noticed that it was really paying attention to the words right next to it. So you can kind of click through. I think this 07 head is the most active head, so it's the easiest to see. It's pretty much without fail looking at the words right before it or right after. Um, but if you look at this 181, uh, the best example from this sentence is the token Lees um, because it's repeated a lot of times. And if you look at Lee or Dudley or Lee's, you'll notice that it actually goes to an area earlier in the sentence that is near another example of Lee's. So if I click on this one, I know it's probably really hard to see, but it lit up Lee was. If you click on this one, it lights up Lee had. If you click on this one, it lights up Lee was again. This one lights up Lee comma. Um, so they found, they're like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, so the second layer of attention is really looking at examples of that token previously in context to try to figure out what it should do next. So like Lee was, or Lee's had, or Lee's sister, this is like what some of the in-context learning is doing when you're prompting is it's kind of looking back on itself and at least, again, this is just like a one layer, two layer transformer, but um, the second layer is really trying to do some of the in-context learning of looking at past examples to help it predict its current ones, which I thought was really cool that they even made, they were just like poking around on this diagram and trying to find patterns, and that was one of the patterns that they found. Um, but it is like some of these ones that are gray are because it's so hard to even see because there's so many different options of words that it could attend to, and these matrices are so large that you have a hard time like looking at the maximum value because the maximum value might even just be like 0 0.001 and uh, it's different for every sentence, so it's kind of, kind of hard to normalize it to make it very clear. But these two attention heads in the different layers are very clear of what's going on there, which is pretty cool. Any questions about what was going on in that visualization? Cool. So I'll go back to our running notes here. Um, so what they call that, what we just saw, is induction heads. So if you're going through the paper and see induction heads, uh, this is the first like sparks of in-context learning and not just doing bigram or trigram statistics. Um, and the word induction in mathematic just kind of in mathematical sense just kind of means like uh, taking examples that you've seen in the past and applying it to the example that you're seeing now to like prove a theorem. So that's that's why they use the word induction. Um, and they have some more explicit examples here where they even notice the pattern, they were like, okay, but what about words that haven't been seen before? And they notice that if it's a word that hasn't been seen before, but it is very close to a word that has been seen before, 
since it's working at in the embedding space, it can still attend to um, patterns of words that it has seen before. And then if it just clearly has no idea about this word, it actually just always looks back at the very start of the sentence, which is interesting because maybe there's like some pattern where you're like, well, I'll just kick us off fresh again and put Mr. Dursley again. Um, so you can see like nonsense period, Mr. Mr. goes back and finds the other example of Mr. and attends to the words around it. Dursley goes back and finds the other example of Dursley and mainly just Dursley itself. Lee looks back at Lee. Uh, oh, sorry, I was doing that wrong. The ones in the gray boxes are looking at the ones in the red boxes um, and trying to predict the ones in the blue boxes. So they have some cool examples of this on the plotter and you can kind of like go through and click and see what is attending to what, which I find pretty interesting. They also um, wanted to see how this worked if it was just like a random pattern of numbers and not actually sentences that mean that meant anything. And they kind of proved the rule or confirmed their hypothesis. Um, because in this random sequence, even though it doesn't mean anything, uh, if you clicked on, I think I clicked on 7192, uh, you can see that it attended back to the previous version of 7192, saw that 717468 was behind it and predicted 7468 after it. So they broke this down into a sequence that wasn't even just words, but like random uh, random numbers and saw the same pattern happening with the second layer. Um, so that helped them have more confidence in this, in this theory that that's actually what's going on. Um, and then the last, kind of thing they did that I thought was pretty interesting is they did what they called a term importance analysis, term meaning like which part of the mathematical formulation of a transformer, not the terms in the sentence, um, but they're trying to figure out like which circuits have the most significant contribution to the outputs. Um, and what they did I thought was really interesting. So they ran the model and saved all of the attention patterns. And then they ran the model again. And for each one of the kind of circuits that they have through the model, they would zero out uh, just the attention head, or they would zero out the residual stream, um, or they would zero out the attention head in the second layer. Um, so you can see this one's like, they're not letting it pass information straight through the residual stream. And this one, they're not allowing it to pass information um, from the first, oh, sorry, I said that wrong. This one, they're only allowing it to pass information through the residual stream. This one, they're only allowing it to pass information through the second layer. And this one, they're allowing it to pass through both. And they noticed that the performance got the worst if they didn't allow it to have that lower level layer of abstraction and just went straight to the higher level, which kind of makes sense. Um, but I just thought in general, that was like a really cool method to trying to test this circuit theory and see which ones have uh, the biggest effect. Um, and then to your, uh, or to the question that was asked before, um, as they build up these layers, they say it gets fuzzier and fuzzier kind of what happens as you go through it, um, mainly because even if you think of this right here, and if you imagine adding another layer, and we're only looking at three attention heads, these things have, you know, eight to 12 to 64 attention heads. 
it gets really hard to follow a path all the way through and understand what's going on there is just this combinatorial problem um but they they do say since um they found this pattern in the two layer one they think that composing them at higher levels would would abstract it even further and further um and so like a concrete example of that might be like a subject verb object pattern across two sentences so you might have like harry flew to hogwarts he studied wizardry in this case uh we have he and he might look at the words around it and be like okay i have studied and i have hogwarts and then so it goes and like says what other words in the sentence could help me disambiguate what he means and since harry also is in this subject verb object pattern of flu is the verb harry's the subject and hogwarts is the object it's like oh well hogwarts and wizardry are really close in concept and he and he did an action and harry did an action you might be able to come you might be able to infer that this references that and take some of the information about Harry into he, the pronoun, um, to continue your predictions. Um, so that's that's called co-reference resolution in natural language processing. But they say that like these components of the skip trigrams and the attending back to other examples of yourself would be able to do these higher level constructs of like subject, verb, object. Um, and since there's a lot of the virtual attention heads, there's a lot of these heads going on here. It's just like really hard to pinpoint what each individual one does, but you know, that's kind of like the magic of these deep neural networks is they're able to combine all of the information and um make a prediction so they kind of left us with like it still feels kind of hand wavy after you get go from one to two to three but i did think it was pretty um informative and like gave a little clarity on at least what the lower layers do and how in theory that could build up to a higher level uh a higher level construct and again this was like research from december 2021 anthropic has tons of other papers on this topic um still a little like mathematical magic if you ask me um but literally the bottom third of the web page for this one is related work on top of this um so if you want to dive in more there's definitely more information there um and i'm just curious like what are other questions do people have about transformers i know it gets hand wavy after this one layer two layer um but do you want to keep going down the transformer path or do you want to see how it applies to vision or continue down the natural language just curious what you guys would be curious or interested on diving into next yeah so I, think I was going to talk about vision like that would be pretty cool um just because i was looking at multimodal stuff the other day and i feel like that is an interesting area um but yeah sorry sorry jeremy go ahead uh you, i was gonna say the exact same thing i think it'd be interesting to explore like the mechanisms behind multimodal for sure yeah i'm cool. completely naive to like you know, they just added the vision thing to ChatGPT, and I'm like, are we doing a lot of OCR here? Is this, you know, some other? Uh, I guess I just like haven't really thought that deeply about how it works. So that kind of stuff would be cool to uh, we'll dive into. Yeah, and I also think since we have a lot of these concepts from language, and we have like a high level map of what a transformer looks like and how it works, it'll be really interesting to slot in like pixels instead of words and see how that could potentially flow through a transformer. Um, so I like that we at least have this 
framework to look back on when we tackle vision, because I think it'll make it all click even more. Andre, I know you did a lot of this mechanistic stuff. Do you have any? Oh, yeah, sorry. I will <laughs> drop us off the recording. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>